taking a picture. So with, um, you're, you tend to generally be known as a writer, <coughs> and yeah. one thing that I'm interested in is, is how you came to want to be a filmmaker. What about film kind of drew you in? Well, um, I started out wanting to be a novelist because um, I was very impressed with certain other novelists, and um, I was in this sort of Fitzgerald sway when I was 16. <coughs> so I went to college thinking that's what I wanted to do. and then. While there, I sort of decided that I didn't really have the heart for that. Um, the, the courage, the, the idea of being the lonely, you know, solitary writer all the time. So I started thinking about <coughs> what else I could do and how to, you know, write and tell stories, but um, have it more of an industrial enterprise. And so in the college years, I became interested in um, film or TV comedy. And <coughs> One of the things um, you could do in college that sort of brought one closer to one's objectives was there was an undergraduate organization called the Hasty Pudding Theatricals, and they put on a very silly musical every year. And so I was, I had left college my sophomore year um, to write <coughs> and had the idea that I wanted to write a um, Hasty Pudding show. And so while I was in Mexico, I wrote a Hasty Pudding show. And I was also doing some journalism. I published my first semi-pro article for The Village Voice when I was 19 in Mexico. There was a lot of strange political violence going on. And I had worked in The Village Voice as a summer job this previous summer and uh, got the article in. And <clears throat> I guess the main thing I'd done um, at Harvard was compete for the newspaper sort of equivalent to the Daily Complainer in um, Damsels in Distress. And I mean that was, the, the Daily Complainer in Damsels in Distress is my version of Howard Crimson, definitely. <clears throat> I remember the guy, you know, s sort of standing up at the table and hand-ranging us <clears throat> when we competed. And there's a very tough competition. Uh, I think it's changed these days. But in those days, there's a grueling 10-week competition to get on the Crimson. <clears throat> And it took, um, you had to sort of work around the clock. Uh, you couldn't study, you just had to work for the Crimson all the time. And um, these experiences sort of went into thinking that in, in film I'd sort of have the same kind of experience. And it turned out to be true. It's very similar um, shooting a film as to being night editor of the newspaper, where you're bringing all these elements together and dealing with everything other people are doing. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I got out of college, um, and I had no idea of how to get from here to there. And um, I flailed around without a job for a while until um, <clears throat> a babysitting assignment. I was a friend's left, and, and they, they stuck me with his younger brothers during a, 
a, a baseball um, uh, pennant race for the Mets, so it was good. We had sort of entertainment while they were away. And the mother took pity on me, and, and when they got back, she introduced me to a guy who was sort of well-connected in literary circles. And he was a Wall Streeter, but he knew people at Doubleday Publishing, and he knew people at The New Yorker. So I had an interview with The New Yorker, <coughs> and I didn't get that job. And another guy from my class at Harvard named Sandy Frazier, Ian Frazier, he sort of got, got, they liked him, they didn't like me. And they thought he was funny, I was not funny. And then I <coughs> got a chance to um, interview for the training program, publishing training program at Doubleday. And because um, I, I, you know, it seemed impossible to get into the film business. And so I started working in book publishing. And what was <coughs> the kind of industry context that was happening the, uh, when Metropolitan was being developed? Well, <coughs> that's jumping ahead many years. Uh, so the revelatory thing for us, I think, was when John Sales did The Return of the Sakaka 7, which was in, I believe, 79. <coughs> and I remember going to see that, and that sort of was the abracadabra, I think, for a lot of us, that, okay, you can be a sort of a short story writer and then make a really low-budget film about stuff you know. And then, <coughs> at the same time, I'd gone over to Spain, and the publication I was then writing for, um, editing, uh, it sort of paid us too much and then went out of business, and so I had savings um, and no job. <coughs> and I went over to Spain to get married, and before getting to Barcelona, we stopped in Madrid. And at a dinner party in Madrid, there were these producers. I'd read the um, Variety special issue <coughs> of um, on the Spanish film industry on the way over. I read it like three times, and I gave the impression I knew a lot about the Spanish film industry and a lot about films generally. And so I, I did know there was a pay uh, pay cable channel starting up that needed Spanish films, and um, that's called Galavision, it still exists. <coughs> and so with the excuse of selling their films to Galavision, they, gave, they confided you know, the right to sell their films to me. And I came up to Montreal, the first film market that was happening was the Montreal film market connected to the Montreal Film Festival that September. And I went up to sell my films there, <coughs> were these films that had been entrusted to me. And I realized you actually don't just sell to one country normally, you sell for the whole world. So I went back to them and um, got the world rights to sell their films. And so I was you know, still writing short stories and, and f trying to write funny stuff, um, <coughs> which I found very hard. Um, there are a couple of people who like them. I think Tom Wolfe, the, the writer, uh, liked them. Um, but it was like too hard work to, you know, it was just so long to get a story that I was happy with. And <coughs> one of the things I found was that in writing a humorous story, I wanted it to be a funny narrator who's not me. And so I had to create a framing mechanism. So there'd be some sort of n narration introducing a document by someone. And then that was the silly tone of voice of some absurd person. <coughs> and um, after this experience I had in the Spanish film industry was like four years, and key was the um, summer of 83. Um, two of the Spanish directors um, I was selling films for, Fernando Treba, Fernando uh, Colomo. And they had been making these little comedies in um, Madrid in the early 80s. They were sort of John Sales but funny. And um, that was eye-opening too, because that takes it another, it's closer to what I want to do. And, and one of the films is called Opera Primo by Fernando Treba, which did get a release here. And it was like a model for that kind of film. It's sort of like the autobiographical Truffaut comedies, <coughs> which I also really admired. And so um, <coughs> in 83, I helped Fernando um, Colomo shoot a super low budget film in New York, sort of reenacting his um, experiences in New York. Um, they brought over a really funny um, Spanish actor named Antonio Racines. And then we would reenact sort of conversations with Fernando. So I played this, they, the character was supposed to be a photographer instead of a film director. Fernando was a film director. And I was his agent, so I was the photographer's agent. I, I had to do the scenes that, but it wasn't important so much the acting in that film. It was seeing how a film could be made incredibly casually. 
there are just six pages of notes Fernando had. And um, I would call up places in the morning to try to get locations um, in the afternoon. And we'd go around, they'd go around their crew, five people in boxy checker cabs with the lighting kit in the trunk and go. <coughs> and um, then the same summer, Fernando Trevo needed an obnoxious American psychiatrist character to be the bat, you know, the, the, the official um, boyfriend of the love interest of the hero, the Spanish hero. So I was the American um, jerk, Dr. Mortimer Peabody, a uh, psychiatrist. And, you know, they had a very sort of caricatural idea of how this guy would be. Because in Europe, um, psychiatry has the reputation in some countries as being sort of authoritarian and right-wing in a certain way. While in the United States, um, <clears throat> I mean, every, nearly every psychiatrist would be on the left. And in the, in the set, they had a picture of Ronald Reagan on this, in my office, supposedly, um, as a psychiatrist, which you know is not what you really do. But anyway, it's a, it's a fun, fun job to have. And I was around there all, all, all summer. So while I was beginning to get into working in Spanish films, I had started the Barcelona script in 83, and then put it aside thinking, this is too ambitious to do as a first film outside my own turf. I will do something as small as possible that I know I could bring off. And the idea of Metropolitan <coughs> was to have something that could be essentially filmed in a room. And the added production value was going to be that um, the characters can be really dressed up and they're going to be wearing these evening clothes and sort of this poetical thing, the after parties, after these dances that we wouldn't have to see the dances, they could just talk about them or whatever. And that we try to get a pretty location and so we'd have really, you know, low budget film but kind of high budget subject and it looked cool that way. And then in writing the script, <coughs> it started getting bigger. And I also learned that um, you didn't have to just shoot in a room. For a very little bit of money, an insurance policy, you get permits to shoot in the streets of New York. So anything in public in New York is free to shoot. You just have to apply for the license and you can shoot it. You don't have to pay anything. So Metropolitan started getting bigger. <coughs>